Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather together to praise and to worship you and to study your word together. I ask that you bless this time, that you encourage all of us in your word, that you build us up and strengthen us, that we may live for your glory, that we may live more obediently to your name, proclaiming your gospel and living out your truth. I ask that you be with any of those here today who have not come to know you savingly, Lord Jesus, just please draw them to yourself that they may find salvation in you. Help me to preach your word faithfully, and it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, one of the greatest theological controversies during the 20th century was known as the Lordship Salvation Controversy. And John MacArthur was one of the absolute heroes during this theological battle. And he summarizes some of the issues going on at that time point during this controversy when he says this. He says, listen to the typical gospel presentation nowadays. You'll hear sinners entreated with words like, accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Ask Jesus into your heart. Or invite Christ into your life. Make a decision for Christ. He says, you may be so accustomed to hearing those phrases that it will surprise you to learn that none of them is based on biblical terminology. They are all the products of a deluded gospel. It is not the gospel according to Jesus. Now, you might be wondering, well, what is wrong with these gospel presentations that MacArthur mentions here, where you ask Jesus into your heart or you make a decision for Christ? Well, they are all watered-down versions of the gospel, because none of them talk about repentance. None of them talk about repenting of your sins, turning from your sins. None of them talk about submitting yourself to the absolute and total lordship of Christ. They are incomplete presentations of the gospel message. And some theologians during this time in the 20th century, during the Lordship Salvation controversy, they were saying that you could know Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. In other words, they were saying you don't have to bow the knee to honor Christ as king. You don't have to submit to him as the Lord. And so instead of Jesus saying, pick up your cross and follow me, these false theologians proclaimed that Jesus that essentially was saying, come to me, let me be your get out of hell free card, but don't worry about taking up your cross. Don't worry about submitting to me. Don't worry about bowing to me as Lord. That was the Jesus of the false theologians of the 20th century. Men such as John MacArthur did what faithful Christians must. They defended the true biblical teaching. MacArthur also said this. He says, Jesus Christ is not just my personal Savior. He is Lord. That is the reality, that Christ is Lord. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Lordship of Christ is absolutely central to the message of the gospel. If you have no confession of Christ's lordship, if you have no submission to him, then you have a heretical gospel that does not save. A gospel that does not confess Jesus is Lord. It is essentially a concoction of Satan that leads people straight to hell. It is a false gospel. The biblical message is that all true followers of Christ bow to him as Lord and confess him as Lord and live to glorify him as Lord. Any other gospel than that is a false gospel, and it must be called as such by the true church of Jesus Christ. Because we submit to him, we kneel to him, we bow humbly before him as Lord, submitting to him. And that's what we're going to see in James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Read that with me this morning. Starting in verse 5. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? 
Therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so we come here to verse 5 this morning with a phrase that has caused biblical commentators a little bit of difficulty over the years. The reason is that if you look, James appears to be quoting a scripture passage in verse 5. However, if you go back through the Old Testament, you won't find these specific words that James uses anywhere in the Old Testament. He seems to be harping back to a general theme, a general theme in the Old Testament that God is jealous and he is jealous over his people. For example, we read about God's jealousy in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. Which says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now whenever we talk about God being jealous, it is a righteous jealousy, not a sinful jealousy. When we speak about him being jealous, it is because he is God and he will not give his glory to another. He, he is zealous for the honor due to his name as he should be, for he is God. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8 explicitly talks about this. That passage says, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. God must not give his glory to another, for he alone is God. He alone is worthy of praise and worship and adoration. And so we are not to bow before any false idol. And so for God to be jealous for the sake of his own name, for his own glory, for his own praise, it is right and it is just. That is a type of a principle that we see James pointing back to. He's pointing back to this general theme in the Old Testament that God is zealous for his own name. So James then goes on, and he says that God yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Now some individuals believe that the spirit that is being referenced here is our own spirit. However, it seems that the more natural reading of the text is that this is actually referencing the Holy Spirit of God. First of all, we see that God has actually made the Spirit to dwell within us. We know that throughout the Scripture, we see references to the fact that God puts His Holy Spirit within those who are His. That once you have come to salvation in Christ, you are given the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said that the Father would send the Spirit in John 14, 26. In his sermon at Pentecost in Acts 2, 38, Peter said that all who are saved would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says this. It says that the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so here again we see this principle that the Holy Spirit dwells within us as believers. And so we are given the promise of a future resurrection. A promise of eternal life with Christ because the Father will raise us from the dead through the Holy Spirit. That we will be given our glorified bodies. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Which, given the totality of Scripture, what we see in James, this is most likely a reference to the Holy Spirit. And also, if you look down at verse 6... It mentions giving more grace, which would appear to coincide with the Holy Spirit being mentioned here. Because we are being given grace to overcome. We are being given grace to follow Christ. So that has a couple of specific things going on here in verse 4. But what is James really trying to get at with this statement? Well, remember that coming into... This passage this morning, we looked at verses 1 through 4 last week, which mentioned selfish ambition, selfish desires, these selfish ways which produced the fruit of fighting and quarreling in the church. And so, in contrast to that, God is yearning over his spirit in us jealously. And we are not to act in ways that disobey him. We're not to act in those ways mentioned in verses 1 through 4, which go contrary to the word of God. 
In other words, everything that we talked about last week regarding the senseless fightings and quarrelings, they must not be named among us as Christians. That these things are not marks of people who have the Spirit of God within them. They are not the fruit of a person who is trying to run the race of life well for the glory of Christ. And so James is saying that in light of the Holy Spirit of God within us, that in light of the fact that we are standing before God, that we are not to run in the way mentioned in the first few verses of this chapter. Instead, we are to conduct ourselves as those who have the Spirit of God that God is jealously yearning over. We are to conduct ourselves in a way that is pleasing and honoring and glorifying to Him. And this jealousy by God is His insistence upon the fact that we obey Him that we adhere and submit to his ways. Look at verse 6. This is where James tells us how God wants us to act. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It is God who gives us the grace to defeat the sinful lusts of our flesh, those sinful desires which result in the fighting and quarreling, and even in murder, according to verse 2 of this chapter. It is the very Spirit of God within us that gives us the grace and the ability to overcome the sinful desires of this world. Therefore, we are told to be humble. Because, yes, we really do fight and we really do war against the ways of the flesh. But it is the Spirit of God at work within us which gives us the desire to fight the sinful ways of this world. To put to death the sin within us. It is the Spirit of God that gives us the ability to wage war against the sin. The quote here in verse 6 that we see, it is likely from two passages. The first is in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34, which says, Towards the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. And so here we're seeing this principle at work that God wants and desires to give favor to those who are humble. He, he, does not, he, he does not give his approval upon those who pridefully mock their sin in a scornful fashion. Pride is ultimately the elevation of self over submitting to the ways of God in your life. In other words, you reject God's ways and you live totally according to your own. You elevate your own desires. Therefore, the opposite of that would be humility. Humility, which is a complete and total submission to the ways of God, that you're going to live according to his ways, that you are not your own ultimate standard, but God is. And if we come to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, we see where it says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, of humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so we see this same phrase here at the end of this verse in First Peter that James uses in chapter 4. So they're undoubtedly pointing to the same concept here whenever they're writing. In contrast to the prideful person in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 4, that person who is stirring up trouble by seeking their own desires, we as Christians are called to be humble. It's a complete contrast here. Oftentimes, as we discussed last week, those individuals who fit into that category of the first four verses, they oftentimes believe and will state that they are doing the will of God, but they in actuality are not doing God's will. Because God opposes those who are proud. He opposes those who are merely seeking their own selfish desires. But he gives grace to those who humbly seek his ways. Therefore, humility is a sign of those who are truly God's. Because this person, they're not out to obtain their own selfish ambitions. What is the humble person out to achieve? They're out to glorify Christ. They're out to submit to the ways of God and to look out for the good of others, especially those of the household of faith. They're essentially seeking to do good as commanded by the word of God. What does it look like to actually live as a humble person, though? What character does this type of godly individual who is humble possess? Well, look at verse 7. Submit, therefore, to God... 
but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submission and resistance. Essentially, there's a way in which we could say that these are the primary duties of the Christian life, to submit to God and to resist the devil. The Greek word for submission here, it literally means to line up under. It was used of soldiers who submitted to the authority of their commanders in that day. And so we are bowing before God. We are seeking to serve God. We are submitting to him in every single way. Because we have been bought with a great price, namely the price of the very Son of God himself. Therefore, we are in essence his joyful slaves. We are those who love to do the will of God. We are those who joyfully submit because we have found that it is the eternal pleasure of our lives to know and to serve and to submit to the ways of God. One example of total submission comes from the words of Christ. John chapter 16 verse 24 which says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so what we see here is the Lord demands complete and total submission. The Christian life is to be one where Christ owns everything. Christ is the dominant reality. The Christian says, for to me to live is Christ. That everything in our lives is centered around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We submit everything to his lordship. And of course, we've seen this is a dominant theme throughout the book of James, haven't we? Think back with me for a second. In chapters 1 and in chapter 3, we saw where we are to have our minds and our speech submitted to the Lord. Chapter 1 also told us to have all of our actions submitted to Christ. Chapter 2 taught us that our decisions, our judgment, our works are, be, are to be submitted to our Lord. Chapter 4 and verses 13 through 17, whenever we get to that point, it's going to show us that we're to have our time submitted to our Lord. Chapter 5 points to the fact that we're called to pray. We're called to praise Christ as his followers. So the point is that every single area of our life is to be lived in submission to Christ. That literally every single action we take, every single thought that we have is to be done in submission to him. This is a dominant theme in the book of James. And this submission takes humility, doesn't it? Because you have to deny yourself. You have to lay down your pride. You have to humble yourself under the ways of God, under the lordship of Jesus. You're not feeding your sinful ego as a Christian. You're not feeding yourself. Instead, you're declaring the lordship of another. You're declaring the lordship of Christ, that he is absolutely sovereign, that he is the dominant authority, and that we are not the dominant authorities. Therefore, this humility is at play here because we're laying down ourselves. Do you know Christ in this saving way? that you must bow to him as Lord. In contrast to the theologians of the 20th century who wanted to say that you could just know Jesus as your Savior, but not as your Lord, that's a false gospel. In contrast to that, the biblical reality is that the followers of Christ bow to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they submit to him. Therefore, the true gospel says that if you are to be saved, you must repent of your sins. You must turn from following the sinful ways of this world and turn to following Christ. You must place faith in him. You must bow to Jesus as Lord, believing upon the Savior who was crucified and raised again on the third day, ascending to the right hand of the Father. As we said in the introduction, one must declare Jesus Christ as Lord in order to be saved. That is a basic reality of the gospel. That that is discipleship 101. That is evangelism 101 in the scriptures, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so you must truthfully submit to him in every area of your life, seeking to honor and to glorify him.
It is by grace alone that you receive salvation. And so I urge you to come to him this day if you have not been saved, to repent of your sins and to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. But the Christian life, as we see by the words of Jesus, it is also characterized as the way of the cross, and that must also be mentioned whenever we're talking about submission. It is a, the way of dying to the sins of this world, of dying to the lusts of the flesh, and if we are called to, to physically die for the sake of Christ. Paul exemplified this in his life, and I imagine many of you remember his words in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, where he says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And so whether he lived or whether he died, Paul's goal was to honor Christ. Needless to say that if we're living this way in our lives, we're not going to exhibit the sinful quarreling and fighting mentioned in verses 1 through 4. Why? Well, what causes that quarreling? It's the sinful desires of our own selfish hearts. The person who is truly seeking to submit to Christ, who's truly seeking to deny themselves, what's the last thing that they're going to fight for? the last thing that they're going to fight for is their sinful, selfish desires. But what's the first thing that they should fight for? The truth of the Word of God, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so whenever they're waging war, it's not this sinful quarreling. And so where you have a place that everyone is dedicated to the Lordship of Christ, submitted to Him, focused on putting to death these sinful desires, you don't have this type of quarreling and fighting that we saw at the start of this chapter. Because the goal of our lives is the magnification of Christ and not the satisfaction of sinful, prideful desires. The aim of your life is to die to yourself and to live to your Lord not to live to yourself and to fight the church. The best way to protect against the sinless, senseless fights and quarreling is to be humbly grounded in the lordship of Christ and the truth of scriptures. The person who's focused on that will not start this type of senseless fighting. But not only are we called to be submissive, we also see in James chapter 4, in verse 7, that we're called to resistance. We are called to resist the devil. Now, you have all types of crazy theology out there in the world today regarding how we as Christians should view Satan. Some people say that you should bind the devil. You hear pastors saying that at the start of their services, that we have bound the devil today. That's their claim. I've always wondered if they bound him at the start of their service, then who let him out at the end of the service? And if, if they bound him this week, then is all, are all the other churches good, or who's got him the next week? It, it makes no sense to say that you're binding Satan. The, the scripture nowhere commands the Christian to bind the devil. Frankly, that's just a theological error coming straight out of the imaginations of modern-day evangelicals who have twisted the scripture. How should we view the devil then? Well, first of all, we should view the devil as a defeated enemy because he was defeated at the cross of Calvary where Jesus Christ defeated him. And he will be banished forever at the second coming of Christ. Now, certainly, whenever I say that the devil is defeated, he still does and still can tempt people. But his power is limited by the authority of Christ. It is Christ's gospel that is advancing. And it is his gospel that is triumphing, not the ways of the devil. Christ is supreme and sovereign, not Satan. And so whenever we view how we as Christians should think about Satan, the first thing that we have to say is that we are counted as victorious over him through the power of Christ, just as we saw in 1 John in our scripture reading this morning. 
And we are told here in James to resist the devil. And we're enabled to do so through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But of course, we know that we as Christians, we're going to have to be equipped for this. If you look at Ephesians in chapter 6, turn with me there for a second. We get a little bit more information here. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. The passage says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the forces, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. And so clearly, I think that we can all see that the idea of this passage is that we are to stand strong against Satan. And we battle, we literally battle against the forces of evil. Now, we read about the armor here in this passage. If you jump down to verses 14 through 17, read that quickly with me. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I'm not going to go through every single piece of armor here this morning, but I do want to point out a couple of things. First of all, if we're going to resist the devil and stand clear, the indication is that we're going to have to do so according to the ways of God, that we have a specific way for us to resist laid out here in Scripture. We're not inventing our own ways to do this. We're picking up the armor that God has prescribed for us. We're walking according to His holy will. And so we're still submitting to him because we're choosing his armor over some wild thing invented of our imagination here. And secondly, I want to point out that none of this armor is defensive. None of it is defensive in the sense that you're supposed to turn around and to run backwards in the opposite, of dire in the opposite direction. And so what we see is that the Christian life is to be lived as marching ahead and fighting for the truth of Christ. None of this armor is given to cover your back. It's all given with the idea that you are marching forward, that you are progressing with the gospel of Christ. And so what we learn here is that we are to stand strong and we are to pick up specifically the tools that God has for us in order to resist the devil. This is the armor of God. It is the armor armor that he has given to us. And so when we come back to James, having read Ephesians, we see that this concept of resistance, when we come to verse 7, this word resist, it literally means to take your stand against. It is the same concept as we see at play in the book of Ephesians. And so James is telling us that our allegiance is completely to our Lord, which means that we stand opposed to Satan and we stand against him. Now look at the last part of verse 7. And he will flee from you. This is the victory of the Christian life through the Lord Jesus Christ that we triumph over the devil through our Lord, and the devil flees. That once we are given salvation, we will never be snatched out of the hand of Christ. But not only that, we are actually given everything we need to fulfill what God has called us to as his church. So it's not just that you're going to be saved. It's that you're actually equipped to live for Christ's sake right here and now. That we are equipped to stand strong amidst the attacks of the devil and to accomplish everything that we have been commissioned to by our Lord.
And so what we see here is that the Christian life, it is one of victory in the sense that the kingdom of Christ triumphs over the kingdom of Satan and that the Christian is equipped to triumph over the evil one. This is in substantial, substantial contrast to the person mentioned in verses 1 through 4 who feeds their fleshly desires by stirring up quarreling battles within the church. We as Christians, we lay down our personal preferences and we submit to the teaching of God's word conquering over the evil one through the victory of Christ on the cross and how he has equipped us to live for his sake. And so we submit to his lordship, seeking to do good to those around us, seeking to proclaim the gospel to the lost, seeking to edify our brothers and sisters in Christ and to strengthen the body, seeking to bring God's word to bear in all of life. These selfish interests are not the focus of our life. We're focused on honoring Christ and doing good to others. That means that people who are truly devoted to the Lord should be able to come together and to resolve their disputes peaceably because we're all seeking to be regulated by the same standard, which is Scripture. We're all operating, should be operating off of the same foundation, which is the work of Christ and the Holy Word of God. And so this means that the goal of our lives as Christians is ultimately to glorify the Lord. We are to resist evil. We are to resist sin and temptation and to stand strong and to stand firm in the ways of our Lord. And that means that we are united together through the blood of Christ, that we are literally brothers and sisters in him standing for the same objectives, standing for the same purposes, being taught by the same holy word, submitting to the same Lord. And so let us then seek to live together, honoring our Lord, not giving into senseless fighting and quarreling, but seeking to magnify our holy Savior. Not only our Savior, but our Lord who also died for us. If you need to talk about anything this morning or if you need prayer, as always, I would be more than happy to discuss things with you or to pray for you in any way that I can. I'll be standing over here after the services and it be my privilege to talk with you. I'm going to ask Brother Tex to come and to lead us in our closing hymn, and I will, let's, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to go into your word together, and I ask that you help us to submit to you, Lord Jesus, in every way. We thank you for your sacrifice that has redeemed us, and we thank you for the fact that you have put your Holy Spirit within us to equip us through your word for everything that you have called us to do. And I ask that you help us to flee from sin and the evil one and from selfish desires, and instead to run fully towards your ways and to walk according to your paths. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.